So much happened that it really needs a talk by itself. It will go on till midnight at the very least. So we'll call part year. one next year, possibly next year. We'll see what you think. Um, I'm not a historian. You've got a president who's a historian. He can tell you in great detail about lots of historical things. To be frank, as a young, I, I don't say younger person, I'll correct that. As a youngster at school, I thought history was rubbish. Honestly, a lot of dates and battles, no one seemed to connect it together. And you have to learn these regurgitated them. So it really didn't mean much to me at all. I wasn't terribly interested. I started my professional studies, if you like, and what got me going as history was. I wanted to know the latest things that were going on. In these days, immunology, uh, molecular biology didn't exist as such. But I went round to various departments, pathology and so on, and arrived at uh, genetics and serology. And that fascinated me. Immunology wasn't the subject then. It fascinated me as to how an antibody interacted with an antigen. And a wonderful lecturer, absolutely amazing chap, would explain these in detail. It was really, really good. That got me going more so, because I was just asking all sorts of things. How do antibodies and antigens actually interact? Or down to molecular levels, one, one done then. How do antibodies create breaches in the, in the membrane of red cells to destroy them? And he would tell me as best he could. He's super. But he said one day, have you, have you heard of Landsteiner? I said, what's Landsteiner? No, I don't. He said, not what, who? So 1900 Landsteiner, Karl Landsteiner, thinking of all the problems, it's not a transfusion lecture by the way, <laughs> thinking of all the problems they had transfusing patients. Some direly ill would recover beautifully with a transfusion, others would die of organ failure. Why? Why? Now Landsteiner, he bled all his colleagues, separated the blood cells of the serum, mixed each with each other one, and he came up with Three reactions. He called A, B, and zero. He called O. And that cracked <coughs> the blood glucose, the basic blood glucose. And I thought suddenly, it came to me like a flash, like a bulb. This man is a genius. A very simple solution. I, lo I loved that idea. Such a simple solution. <coughs> he solved the major problem of transfusion. Same with astronomy. Now these wonderful people, now you'll maybe say to me after the end of this, I would have included so and so, but there's so many people and so many events which build up astronomy from the earliest times, I couldn't include all of them. You might just say, why did you include that one? Okay, it's my choice. <laughs> so, what I'm going to do is talk about theories, theories and ideas. And what I just said about understanding subtly was some inspiration that people have genius. I, I, I wasn't like that. Most of us aren't like that. We don't have that ability. But throughout history there have been these people who have had this genius who could 
do what nobody does, they were very simple things, but actually they were leaps forward and often built on previous knowledge. Now you know the saying, universe, you know the saying which was used by come on, Isaac Newton. It's a lovely, lo one of my favourite quotes of all times. Newton didn't invent it, people think he did. He simply used it. If I have seen further by standing on the shoulders of giants, that is a profound statement and one of the most truthful statements ever. Except, as we probably know, Newton wasn't using it in its pure form. He used it in a letter to Robert Hooke, who was his contemporary and just as much a genius as Newton. But Newton had the power, he had the adulation of the crowds, and he put Hooke down. And what the saying really is referring to is Newton saying, Ah, Hooke, who had a, a spinal deformity, and he was bent and stooped. I didn't see further by standing on the shoulder on his shoulders, physically or mentally. So it wasn't such a pure statement after all. But there you go. That's one I like. I like that statement, but it wasn't invented by, by Newton. The other one I do like, in terms of scientific investigation, is science is made up of mistakes. But they are mistakes which is useful to make. And we all in science make mistakes from what we observe, but it's useful to make because they lead little by little to the truth. That's a rather nice statement as well. So what I'm going to do to start with, I'm going to talk about events which led to modern astronomy, <coughs> peppered by genii, geniuses who through the ages invented, thought of things to explain their observations. Any theory is based on trying to explain the observations that you make, and they sometimes can be wrong. So let's go back to the earliest, earliest times. Let's go back, take you back to 2001, A Space Odyssey. <laughs> Remember the, the dawn of man that uh, Arthur Clarke wrote about, and the, the apes who... One, oh, wrong one. Takes time. It should be a movie. It's not moving. Not there it is. There it is. Yeah. So remember that bit in the, in the film where they were in their caves. And of course, ancient man, when awareness was dawning, and they were frightened of not having food, or being eaten by saber-toothed tigers, or whatever was going around in these days, and they would hide in their caves at night, relatively secure, and they would look out, I imagine, in my imagination, They'd look out through the opening of the caves and there must have been one or two among them who pondered on what they were seeing, who looked out and saw patterns of stars. And this guy would say, hey, Betty, you see these little dots of light out there? Do they look like to you like a mm. something that, you know, yeah, they do, Fred. They look a bit like that. <laughs> and so, we go back 16,500 years mm -hmm. to the French caves, caves Lascaux, mm -hmm. the painting here that they saw, they had lots of paintings of animals that they would hunt, naturally. This was part of the ritual. But among these paintings was Fred's animal, mm -hmm. the horns. And when you look at it carefully, I'm not saying it is, and people aren't def definitively, the can't say definitively, but I was looking at the sky, and did they see the Hyades? And even more clearly, did they see the Pleiades just in the right position? Very strange. Now, in the wall of that cave, just to the left here, is a figure that looks like Gemini. So, there is a feeling that a few of these people breathing awareness in their heads would be able to look at the sky and start to make patterns of the static stars. And that to me is the first uh, inkling of astronomy. Now, 
we jump forward a bit, we jump forward to Egyptian times and throughout the ages, I'm quite sure, people wondered, the sun, that's a bit odd. It goes away somewhere at night and it comes back out in the morning. Here we come to the point where you've got to make theories to explain what you're, what you're observing. You're observing something. So the explanation the Egyptians gave was that the, the sun god, Nut, sky goddess, ate the sun god in the evening and gave birth to it every morning. That is an explanation for you. But what I'm pointing out is they're starting to make explanations for their sightings, for what they see. That's what theory is all about. It need not be correct, maybe modified later. You have trouble with the second statement I give you about theory being wrong. That's one of the problems. If a theory has been worked on for a long time, it's proven to be wrong. It's very unpopular with the scientists who spent all their lives working on that particular theory. They have a problem with that. Now, Fred Hoyle's a classic with the steady state. We're not going to go into this now, but Fred Hoyle's a classic. He held on to the steady state theory despite the proof building up of the Big Bang. So, here's a theory. We know it's not correct, but it's a theory. The amazing thing, we're talking now about 4,000 years ago, about the same time, we had the Chinese. Who could predict eclipses? Certainly lunar eclipses. We believe many, perhaps not all, solar eclipses. Just by persistent observation. Remember too that at this time throughout the world, astronomy and astrology merged together. In fact, astronomy was really for the purpose of astrology. So the Chinese could predict these eclipses, and one in particular I just want to go over, you've probably heard it before, but it's worth mm -hmm. going over. October 22nd, I don't know which calendar that is actually, 2134 BC, a solar eclipse in China. Now, when the eclipse, a solar eclipse took place in the Chinese area, they believed, again, it's a theory, that a dragon was eating the sun. So what they had to do is to make lots of noise with trumpets and drums and so on to chase the dragon away. And the point is it worked every time. <laughs> so you continue to do it. But the, the point also is that they needed the astrologers to predict what it would happen so they could get their drums and all the rest of it ready to chase that dragon away. Otherwise doom would befall them. The story goes that from this little bit of poem, here lie the bodies of Ho and Hai, whose fate was sad and visible being slain because he could not spy the eclipse, which was invisible. Owen High, the court astrologers, failed to predict this particular eclipse, and it's believed to be that they were uh, inebriated. <laughs> that is what this, this story goes. I think the story is true fundamentally, but they were inebriated. And sadly, they suffered quite badly from that inebriation. Um, we'll go no further into the fate of poor Owen High. But the fact was, <coughs> the amazing fact was he could predict these things due to repeated observation. And he could then predict what was going to happen. He didn't know what was happening, but he could predict it. <coughs> About the same time, come further north, come to Britain, come to Scotland. And what do you have in the sky? Going back to the sun. Now in the tropics, the sun doesn't do an awful lot. It'll go down towards Cancer or Capricorn, up to the equator and back and down again. But up north, in our latitude, the sun changes dramatically between summer, June and between December. It's a huge drop from 1 over 50 degrees to just over 10, 11, 12 degrees here in the middle of winter. It's a heck of a difference. Now again, the astrologers are druids, I suppose, in the main, but the, the priests then were a bit worried, because as the sun dropped downwards in the winter towards December, fine, it's going to come back up, we hope. They might decide, we're fed up with this lot, eh, we're not going to come back up again. So what they did was to mark the positions carefully of the sun through the year from a particular point, perhaps a sacred point, a burial point, and they would put stones in 
and here's Cavendish, and you ever been to Cavendish? Yeah. Yeah. No. So, it's worth a visit if you, if you haven't been. I took the bike out there once, and it's amazing. And there's an aerial view of it, and there's the stones that are standing. So about 4,000 years ago, these stone circles were being built. Now I've got a diagram of a couple of them to show you the complexity they reached. This is Stonehenge, and this is uh, Castle Rig. And you see what happened. They put the first stones at the lowest point of the sun, where it rose, where it set. Then they would go through to midsummer, the highest point, they marked these two stones. Then remember the moon was a great um, aid to timekeeping. So the mark, as you can see, uh, various mood setting, most northerly, with some of sun, so it became more and more complex. But all these stones meant something. They were the first observatories, the first calendars as well, working on the moon and working on the sun. There were stones put in there for the priests to mark a time before midwinter was a particular. People thought midsummer, midwinter was the problem. The sun would have come back up again. That was really important. Mm -hmm. So they would need a marker, and they sometimes use, I believe, the Pleiades as being a marker. So if the Pleiades set behind a hill, they would say, oh, it will be 20 days of whatever at this time, or till the, the mid, mid winter time. So they could prepare their sacrifices or their whatever ceremonies they did. So there you have it. We're developing into being able to predict eclipses, to predict the movement of the sun and, and the moon in particular, they were the great things for, for keeping time. The ancient people, ancient people knew very well that there were movable stars in the sky, planets and movable stars. And they knew very well too that they wandered in strict limits along the ecliptic, along the zodiacal constellations. And again, there's another aid to um, astrology, because they used where the planet rested in the star patterns astrologically. So astronomy and astrology were still built together hugely. Moving on a bit further, we come to the, the great Greek mathematicians and astronomers. And they discovered so many things that were lost in the Dark Ages. They knew that, that thing very well in, in this. 384, 325 BC, mm -hmm. Aristotle. Now I'll pick out individuals because these to me are often time they're genius people. They're actually genius because they interpreted either correctly or made good assumptions from what they saw. And Aristotle looked at the stars, he looked at particular the pole star, and he noted that if he moved north or south, the height of the pole star especially would change. Now the only thing that would cause that to happen was if he was moving over the sphere. So this business of the flat earth that we hear about in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, it was fully understood back in Greek times that the earth was a sphere. What else did he notice? He saw lunar eclipses and we saw a month or so ago. And he saw this happening. He saw a shadow, we correctly assume it's a shadow of the earth, <coughs> passing over or the moon passing into it. And every time it happened, the shadow had a curve, which he took to be the shape of the earth. So it was always the same, therefore it meant it was always it must be the sphere. So these facts were known by observation. This is the great thing about we're pinning down observation and deducing facts from them. And the facts are sometimes very often accurate. He devised a plan of what he saw. The planets were known to be separate from the stars, the fixed stars. The moon, the sun and so on were within our own boundary of our solar system. And his diagram showing the structure of what we call the solar system nowadays was the first one again showing Earth in the middle. He knew the curvature of the Earth, but he, didn't, he still thought it was the centre. And that was fundamental because what they saw <coughs> during the, the nighttime sky and the daytime sky was the moon, the sun and all the stars literally moving around us. 
That's the way it looked. So it's a reasonable theory that we are stationary and stars sort of move around us. Because that's what we see. We don't feel any motion, we simply see them moving. So that's a reasonable, a reasonable diagram at that time. Now we go to one of my great heroes. Absolutely great hero. Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes was the, now they're called the librarian. That's a, a very ineffective word for what he was. In Alexandria, the library there was the, the fundamental seat of knowledge of the entire known world. It was, it was like Super Oxford from Cambridge, and he was in charge of this. And all the academics and all the, the wise men would come to the Alexandria Library. And apparently, the story goes that one day at Alexandria, he met a fellow who said to him, Hey, Eratosthenes, I was in Syene, just about south of Alexandria. It was the 21st of June, mid summer's day. And when the sun was at its highest point, it shines down the well, and you can see the water. It's the only day you can see it, the only time you can see it. Now, we would, most of us, I would just say, well, that's interesting, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and walk away. <laughs> and the great thing about Eratosthenes, this is what makes people great. He said, what happens here in Alexandria? Okay, so next June 21st, we'll put a stick in the ground, check its vertical, and exactly on midday when the sun's at its highest point, we'll measure the shadow and see what it does. It's not shining straight down at Alexandria, it's a shadow. We measured that and worked out the angle from the top of the pole downwards. Now, that's very simple. And the actual calculations thereafter are quite simple. There was the overhead rays from the sun in Alexandria. The shadow was, was made seven, just over 7 degrees, 7.2 degrees. You realise that that angle there was the same as the angle to the centre of the Earth. So if you've got 360 degrees for a whole circle, you divide it by 7, 7 degrees 12 minutes, roughly a tenth of a circle, and if you then measure the distance between these two places, you've got the circumference of the Earth. Now, it sounds, it's a simple calculation, but it's brilliant. That, when I heard about that, it was like um, the Landsteiner, it just got me. Oh, that's amazing.